Hi, everyone. It's such an honor to be with all of you. And thank you very much, Adrian, for the land acknowledgement. That means so much and segues into what I want to talk about today. Um, <clears throat> first, you have this historic moment that's happening as we sit here today at Baruch, which is the impeachment inquiry into President Trump. Let's only hope that it expands beyond uh, what they are talking about right now to so many critical issues, like the deaths of children in U.S. custody on the U.S.-Mexico border, the separation of thousands of families, um, and the critical issue of climate change. And the president of this country, the climate change denier in chief, um, pulling the United States out of the Paris Climate Agreement, the only country in the world to be pulling out. But the good news is there are movements all over this country that are linking up with movements all over the world. It is only empowering and inspiring them. As we speak now, there is the longest presidential primary period in US history. We're talking about looks like a couple of years now. Why does this matter? Well, I put the question to Elizabeth Warren, one of the leading Democratic presidential candidates on Friday night in Orangeburg, South Carolina, at Orangeburg State University, Orangeburg in 1968. You might not know it, but it was the site of the first massacre on a US campus. African-American students weren't allowed to bowl at the local bowling alley. And so they started to protest for one day, two days, three days. They built a bonfire on campus, and the South Carolina state troopers moved in and opened fire on the students who wanted to bowl. And they killed three kids, two 19-year-old college students and a 17-year-old who came to the university campus every day after school to get a bite to eat and see his mom and critically wounded many others, 28 were injured. You know, if we had only taken seriously Orangeburg, this was before Jackson State and the killing of students there. This was before troopers opened fire on Kent State, which is most well known because we're talking about white students. Maybe Jackson State and Kent State wouldn't have happened. That is why journalists, artists, it is so important that we bear witness. So on Friday night, I co-moderated with Mustafa Santiago Ali the first ever presidential forum on environmental justice. It's not just climate change, but it's about who Im impacts the most in the world, the front line and fence line communities. And to her credit, Elizabeth Warren came, Cory Booker came, Tom Steyer came, and other candidates. At the end of our questioning of Senator Warren, I asked her if she was concerned that the first two primary states, that's Iowa and the two of the first primary states, Iowa and New Hampshire, are the whitest states in the country over 90% white. Why does it matter? Because these are the states that determine the presidential candidate. They drop out after that. They don't have the means to go on if they don't get support there. And why does that matter, that they are overwhelmingly white, that when even in the Democratic Party, more than 40% of the voters are non-white? It matters that people have a voice, that they are represented which brings us to Standing Rock and why I so deeply appreciate this land acknowledgement. Back in 2016, the standoff at Standing Rock and how we need a media that actually conveys what's happening on the ground. April 1st, 2016, LaDonna Brave Bull Allard of the Standing Rock Reservation, the unofficial historian of the tribe, opened her property along the Cannonball River to the resistance. She said, you know, if people would like to come and resist, what? The $3.8 billion, what they call Black Snake, Dakota Access Pipeline. 
that would be built from the back and oil fields of North Dakota through South Dakota um, through and make its way hooking up with a pipeline to the Gulf of Mexico. And the Standing Rock Sioux were saying no. Now, they actually weren't very different than more, most North Dakotans. The people of Bismarck, the capital, said no, and their views were respected. The people of Mandan, uh, where the courts and the prison is, where so many hundreds of Native Americans were imprisoned for their protest. Many of the guards, I dare say, were from the area, had said no to the pipeline, and their views were respected. The Standing Rock Sioux were just not as lucky. And so they stood up. And they said no. They said no to energy transfer partners that owns the Dakota Access Pipeline. And it was beyond that. They were concerned that if the pipeline was built under the Missouri River, the longest river in North America, it would imperil the water supply of some 17 million people, many of them non-native. But they cared about everyone. And they cared about sustainability of the planet, pipeline politics. They were leading the charge against this unsustainable form of energy that is not empowering our planet, but depleting it. And so she thought a couple dozen people would come and she would host them, and a couple dozen people came, then a couple hundred, then a couple thousand. Then it became the largest unification of native tribes um, that this country has seen in decades. Nations from Latin America, from the United States, First Nations from Canada, and all their non-native allies, thousands and thousands of people. I mean, she set up the sacred uh, stone camp, and there was the Red Warrior Resistance Camp, and they just kept growing. Democracy Now! was covering this from afar. Of course, it was getting almost no attention in the corporate media. And we went there Labor Day weekend of September 2016. And what we saw was really astounding. We saw Native American leaders, indigenous activist kids, adults, teenagers, holding water ceremonies on these back roads, holding up glasses of water, and then making their way in their protests. They didn't call themselves protesters, they called themselves water protectors. And they would face up against the fully militarized sheriff's departments of North Dakota. These were their neighbors, by the way. And they would say, they would hand the water and say, this is for you, not just for us. This is for your children, not just for ours. And then these militarized police departments, sheriff's departments, would face them with MRAPs, that's with tanks, with automatic weapons, with um, mace and tear gas. And they'd say, but we're doing this for all of us to survive. And that's what we were capturing that Labor Day weekend. And then came Saturday, and we heard that Native Americans were going to be planting tribal flags. This is a holiday weekend, and an area they called their sacred site. And so we went to follow them, and there they were. And they were, that's when they saw the Dakota Access Pipeline bulldozers on the sacred land. Now, a judge was going to rule in a few days, and the judge said, to be fair, okay, you say it's your sacred land, you prove it to me. You give me the maps that proves this. So they did. They got together and they gave the judge the map. And the judge gave it to the other side, energy transfer partners, because that's what judges do. And when the Native Americans came up on this land, they realized that energy transfer partners, they felt that energy transfer partners had used these maps against them. They'd taken the maps, the bulldozers were way down the road, and they brought them here to the sacred land to destroy it before the judge ruled, and it would be a moot point. And they were enraged. And the women in indigenous garb and their kids came up and they stood in front of the bulldozers. One, two, three, four, five, six of these bulldozers. Incredibly brave act. I mean, when I saw them, you know, these are earth crushing machines. I thought about a few days before the US invaded Iraq. It was March 16, 2003, in another part of the Middle East in Gaza. And I thought about a young American woman uh, named Rachel Corey, who went to um, Evergreen College in Olympia, Washington. And she was about to graduate, but she wanted to go participate in a movement for peace and went to Gaza and with the International Solidarity Movement. And 
she had befriended a Palestinian pharmacist and his family was, uh, their home was about to be demolished. And so she and other activists stood in front of the home and the Israeli military bulldozers built by Caterpillar in the United States were moving forward and she stood in front of it with a bright orange construction vest, you know, like construction workers wear. And she was crushed to death by the bulldozer. And that's what was in my mind as we were filming and we see these women holding hands with kids and they're standing in front of these machines that are crushing the earth. But this time they prevailed. The bulldozers pulled back. One, two, three, four, five, six of them moving back. And the people were moving forward and more people came from the resistance camps and they were moving forward and it was then um, we saw one guard jump on top of one of the native activists. Um, we saw then the guards unleash dogs on the water protectors. Dogs. And they were biting these citizens of the planet. And we were just rolling our cameras. Um, but still, the people prevailed. Finally, the guards took their dogs, the bulldozers pulled back, they got into their pickup trucks, the bulldozers moved away, and the people prevailed at a ridiculously high price. They were bitten, they were maced, they were beaten, but they prevailed that day, and we had the film. Why it is so important, and all that you do in bearing witness is so important. Why it is so important to go to where the silence is. And by the way, so often it is not silent. It's just that the, it doesn't hit the corporate media radar screen. So we took our film, and that night we posted online. Now, sometimes I'm invited on MSNBC and CNN to talk about different issues, and I always say, why aren't you covering climate change more, the climate crisis, the climate catastrophe? And hosts say, we want to, but the executives say, People aren't interested. They don't get enough eyeballs. They don't get enough attention. I said, really? I think people are extremely interested. I actually even think in your corporate networks, there would be a very good payoff for you. But they say no. So we posted this video online, and within 24, 48 hours, there were 14 million views. We had to fly out, but we were continuing to cover what was happening. So that next week, the judge was going to rule on Friday after Labor Day weekend. Again, in the midst of the presidential election of 2016, do you know in the debates that year, in the general election debates, there was not one question asked about the climate crisis. I'm not even talking about the standoff at Standing Rock, which was historic, but even about the climate crisis. And this sets the agenda for whoever is going to be president, because they understand at this point, this moment that is very important, the primaries, the candidates are paying attention, they wanna win, they want votes. But if the questions aren't asked, they think that's not an issue people care about. So we go home, but we're continuing to cover it here in New York, what's happening. And on Thursday, well the judge was gonna rule on Friday, the governor at the time of North, Car of North Dakota named Governor Dalrymple, called out the National Guard in preparation for the decision the next day. It didn't look good for the tribe. And what I didn't know at the time is the authorities on that day also quietly issued an arrest warrant for me. So the next day, Friday, um, we did the show and Nermeen Sheikh, my colleague at Democracy Now!, co-host of Democracy Now!, and I were heading off to uh, Canada um, for the Toronto, well, we weren't fleeing, we weren't fleeing. Uh, it was the Toronto International Film Festival and they were showing a film that day about the great muckraking journalist I.F. Stone, um, who was teaching journalism students and said, if you can remember two words, remember governments lie. If you can remember three, remember all governments lie. And that's the name of the documentary uh, that you should see. And um, we were going to speak after it, because it featured, after talking about the life of I.F. Stone, Democracy Now! as following in I.F. Stone's footsteps. I wasn't going to even go, but I thought, you know, we've just come from North Dakota, and uh, people in Canada care about First Nations. We should talk about what we just saw in the last few days. So we're speaking afterwards, and um, the next day, speaking at University of Toronto, and hundreds of people were there, and... 
In the middle of the talk, like right now, I always carry my phone. I hate to call uh, this corporate product my brain, but um, it said, you're under arrest. My phone, I got a text. And so I think, okay, who in the audience, I'm looking at everyone's faces, someone must have hacked my phone, what the heck, I'm in the middle of a talk. And I look, is this some kind of scam? Well, no, I see a North Dakota number, so I'm nervous. Now, I understand how this works. You know, if there is an arrest warrant for you, you're not going to automatically be arrested unless you have some interaction with FBI police or border guards. And I look around. I don't want to let it be known what I just saw. So I just said, could someone call a cab? Because you know, I'm in Canada, I have to get back to the United States over the border. <laughs> so I race to the airport and I do make it back to New York. And in fact, this was real. And we knew we had to do something about it. I didn't take it personally. I really felt it was the North Dakota authorities saying to journalists around the world, do not come to North Dakota, which is exactly why we had to be there. I mean, the people on the front lines were the indigenous activists. It is so critical that we all see what they are doing. And so we decided to call their bluff, and we headed back to North Dakota. As we're arriving in Bismarck on the plane, um, they announce that they've quashed the arrest warrant against me. Um, we wanted to stop the bullies, but then we heard they were going to bring more serious charges against me, charges of felony riot. Like I'm a one-woman riot? So I call my North Dakota lawyer, not that I had one before, and I said, what does this mean? And he said, it's not the worst thing in the world. Uh, you face maybe a year in prison. I said, well, I don't know about your life, sir, but like that matters to me. And I said, how much time do I have? He said, three days. He said, it's Friday and you'll be arraigned 1.30 on Monday. And so I thought, okay, we have, we have three days to cover the protests, which we did. And then on Monday morning, the show must go on. You know, Democracy Now! airs on 1,500 stations around the globe and also translated into Spanish. And the show goes on at 8 a.m. every morning um, right here in New York. Oh, there's the music I think I have to finish. Um, and so, um, oh, that's distracting. Uh, I guess that's what it feels like when you win an Oscar or something and the music goes up. Uh, so, okay, so uh, we had to, the show had to go on. We had to figure out where we could broadcast. We broadcast in front of the court and the prison in Mandan. And then I could turn myself in. So we get a broadcast truck from Minneapolis. It comes up in the backdrop of the court and the prison. Oh, the Ten Commandments were in between. And we broadcast the show. I interviewed the chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux, Dave Archambault. And I said, have you been arrested? He said, of course. He said, I was arrested for civil disobedience. I mean, this is like a misdemeanor. I said, and what did you face? He said, oh, I was strip searched. I was put in an orange jumpsuit and I was jailed. I interviewed Dr. Sarah Jumping Eagle, the pediatrician of the Standing Rock Sioux. And I said, were you ever arrested? Yeah, I was one of the first. I care about the health of the children. And I said, what happened to you? She said, I was strip searched and I was put in an orange jumpsuit and I was jailed. How much humiliation can a people take? And so we did the show. I'm about to turn myself in. I get a call from North Dakota Public Radio. The judge is not going to dare uh, have you arraigned. The media was all covering this because a journalist was about to get arrested. It was the homepage of the BBC, Al Jazeera, New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Vogue magazine was covering this. And so he decided not to bring the charges. But most importantly, many of the Native Americans that were going to court that day had their charges dropped. This is what happens when the media shines a spotlight in the right direction. This is the kind of reality television we must support. Not the kind he stars in, but the kind that shows the reality of people's lives on the ground. Whether we do it as journalists, whether you do it as artists, it is absolutely critical that we go to where the silence is and say something. Thanks so much, Democracy Now!